I want to start with a couple of stories. Uh, about 15 years ago, I was sitting in a bar at a conference and struck up a conversation with a man uh, who I knew to be Dan McGovern, who had been the administrator of EPA's Region 9 in the early 90s. I knew that Dan had made a decision that was really tough, one that had thrown all of California water into turmoil. And I knew that Dan probably expected to get fired as a result of that decision. So I asked him about it. And what he said has stuck with me. What Dan said was, as you rise in a job, you're going to face lots of opportunities to do what is right and know that it would get you fired and pass it by. Oh, it's not working? Thanks. But at some point, <clears throat> you reach a decision, you face a decision where the right is worth the risk and you take the leap. So tonight, I'm going to be talking about cliff divers, people who take a leap. Now, a cliff diver <coughs> jumps, and sometimes they hit rock. Sometimes they hit water and survive. And sometimes, in taking the leap, they do something that matters and make a real difference. And that's, that's really what I want to talk about tonight, people who take a leap and make a difference. So when I started my career, I was working as a groundwater hydrologist, working in the deserts of the southwest, drilling wells, and then doing basin analysis. It was a really terrific job. I loved it. I was out in the, doing field work in really isolated, desolate, beautiful places, followed by a jarring reentry into writing reports and traffic and the beaches of Los Angeles. It was a really great place to be as a young man. Um, but I, was, I knew that in drilling those wells, when they were pumped, they'd be pumping water that wouldn't be replaced until the next ice age. It was literally irreplaceable water. Sometimes that made sense to me. We were drilling wells for some of the desert cities and, and providing water for people. But sometimes it made less sense to me when we were drilling wells that primarily was growing alfalfa to be used for dairy cattle. And that water in the form of dairy would then be exported to, to the cities and to other, other better places. <clears throat> and that conflict mattered to me. It created a, a sense of urgency in me to work on water policy. How could we balance the needs of people and the needs of fish and wildlife, particularly in those desert areas where I knew the wells were literally sucking the water, sucking the water out of the springs and sucking the life out of the desert. That, that conflict led me to a career in water policy. It led me to become a lawyer, an advocate, and sometimes a lobbyist. And, you know, when I look back over the, the 30 years I've worked uh, in water policy, I have to say that there have been some terrific successes. I've helped protect some beautiful and important places. I've helped stop some environmentally damaging projects. There are a few dams that have been taken down that I had a hand in. Um, and we've worked to make a few places, small places, better. But on the whole, I'd say that we haven't accomplished very much. If you look at how water is used at a basin scale, at a state scale, at a regional scale, at a national scale, at a global scale, we have a long way to go. In the areas that I work, western water, every major river is home to endangered species, threatened and endangered species listed under the Endangered Species Act. From the Columbia to the Rio Grande, from the Sacramento to the Missouri, all, all of those projects, all of those rivers have water projects that are run, at least in large part, uh, to protect those endangered species. But the ESA really only keeps uh, those fish on life support. It really doesn't work to restore those fish even to a, a reasonable level, much less abundance. We need something more. And if you look around the entire country, you see that we are continuing to use water wastefully. We're continuing to export water from dry places in the form of product and food to wet places. Fish and wildlife are not doing well. 
cities and farmers, people who depend on water, are utterly unprepared for droughts and floods that, that they know are coming. And climate change is making all of those problems worse. Now water, um, particularly water supply, is really typically a zero-sum game. You have a lot of different interests fighting over the same bucket of water. So whether they're irrigators, whether they're cities, whether they're tribes, whether they're environmentalists, we all want the same thing, and that creates a lot of conflict. That sets up my favorite quote in water. There we go, John F. Kennedy. Anyone who solves the problem of water deserves not one Nobel Prize, but two. One for science, and the other for peace. So I think that if, if water is one of those issues that we need um, to do more in, we need to think bigger, we need to think more broadly, uh, we need to work harder, we need leadership, we need cliff divers. So I want to tell the next story. It sounds sort of like a setup uh, for, a, for a joke, but a few years ago, um, a Native American uh, Yakima, Yakima Nation uh, resources manager, a Rosa Irrigation District leader, and an environmentalist walk into a room. <laughs> it wasn't a bar. <laughs> and it wasn't a courtroom, which is actually a more likely place that you find all of them. It was the office of uh, Senator Maria Cantwell in D.C. To be a senator is to be asked for things. It's to be asked to pick winners and losers in contested issues. When Senator Cantwell saw these people walk in, she was kind of surprised. She knew that these people all had been in her office asking for things, usually at the expense of the other people in that party, and that they had been adversaries for decades. Actually, for generations, they had been adversaries. And they walked in her office, and they were loose. They were joking with each other. They clearly had a, relation, a working relationship and they had a united ass. And that was something different. That's something that she paid attention to. So the story tonight is, how did you get to the point where you had these people who are adversaries walk in with the united ass? And the answer to water is always, well, 150 years ago, every story starts, a, I, I don't go quite back, you know, billions of years. But every story starts, well, 150 years ago. So 150 years ago, um, after the, uh, uh, like many places in the West, after the Indian treaties were, were signed, settlers moved in, and of course they started diverting water from the rivers. Well, the rivers soon ended up not having enough water, so the settlers built small dams, create reservoirs to let the water flow deeper into the summer when they needed to irrigate. Those quickly ran out, and we ultimately got the Federal Bureau of Reclamation to come in and build five major dams and reservoirs um, between 1910 and 1933, and hundreds of miles of irrigation canal. The result was the Yakima Project, which as federal water projects go, is a rock star. It has been economically hugely successful. The Yakima Basin produces about $4 billion in agricultural productivity. It's one of the biggest agricultural basins in the country, and certainly the biggest in the state of Washington. And it created enormous numbers of winners. But, and you know there's going to be a but. <laughs> but there were a lot of losers too. The Yakima Nation, which had reserved the right to fish in its treaty, saw the 800,000 or so salmon that returned every year dwindle to about 4,000 by the mid 1990s. Sockeye, Coho, Summer Chinook all went extinct. Environmentalists, of course, didn't like it. We were not happy with the, with the, um, decline of the salmon, and we didn't like the rivers being treated as irrigation canals. But even some farmers were losers, too. In the Yakima Basin, far more water was claimed than was available. The result was our favorite pastime, fighting over water. Giant lawsuit uh, instigated after uh, a serious drought in 1977, Aquavela. 33, uh, excuse me, 6,600 parties, all adverse to each other. Um, that lawsuit, of course, is still going on. It's in the final stages. And it never decided how much water the fish get. And it didn't even touch groundwater. So we've got fights, fights uh, to, to face in the future. Um, 
but it certainly created a sense of uh, adversity uh, among among um, uh, the various interests fighting over water. And then you have drought. Drought comes along in this basin. Since 1970, we've had about 14 significant droughts. Every couple of years, um, we get another another one. The one in 2015 was somewhat different. 2015, this last year, was unusual because we actually had pretty close to normal precipitation. But that precipitation fell as rain rather than snow. And in the Yakima, we rely on the, on the Cascade snowpack as our sixth reservoir, sixth and largest reservoir. If the precipitation falls as rain, it runs off right down the rivers. It doesn't stay. It doesn't, it doesn't end up in the rivers in the summers. That's really bad for the farmers, and it's really bad for the fish. The problem is, is that it's com what we had in 2015 is very consistent with what the climate models show we should be expecting as the new normal in just a few years. So climate change is making, uh, it looks like it will make every year a drought year in the Yakima. So what do we do in the West when we see, when we have problems with not enough water? There are two main solutions and that they've been used time after time after time. The first is you build a bigger dam, and the second is you reach out and take somebody else's water. Watch the movie Chinatown sometimes, my favorite, Faye Dunaway, Jack Nicholson, great movie, it's about incest. No, it's about water. <laughs> Watch it, it's a perfect, perfect, uh, perfect explanation of stealing water from one part of California for another. So in the Yakima, we said, oh, we know how to do that, and um, thus was born the Black Rock Project. Black Rock Project would pump water out of the Columbia River, store it in a giant dam, um, and then release it into, into uh, use in, in the Yakima Valley. Well, the problem with that is um, the Yakima Nation saw that they had fish, significant numbers of fish, in the Columbia, and we would be taking water from the Columbia and uh, with the speculative hope that there would be water in, for fish in the Yakima. So they, they, had, they were dead set against the project. We in the environmental community, we sort of have a philosophical opposition to big water projects and dams. So we were opposed on that basis, but we were also concerned about some of the specific impacts of the dam. But it wasn't just us, it was also some of the irrigators. The irrigators saw that this project was going to cost several billion dollars, seven was one of the numbers, and that they, they would be responsible for re repayment of a significant portion of that. And once they ran the numbers, they realized it didn't make economic sense for them. So that's where we were in about 2008, as we walked up to the edge of the cliff. We had toxic relationships among all the parties. We knew we had serious problems. The solutions that were proposed, BlackRock in particular, didn't look like it was gonna, gonna go forward. And um, people didn't really talk to each other. A uh, Yakima Nation employee that, that I talked to about that time said that at that time, if he were to even talk to a Rosa Irrigation District employee, both of their jobs would be at risk. So what do you do? You cue the cliff divers. So the first cliff diver I'm going to talk about is kind of unlike Ron Van Gundy ran the Rosa Irrigation District for about 30 years. He is, um, in the water business, he'd be referred to as a water buffalo. He's, you know, kind of the <laughs> old guard. He's a vigorous advocate for irrigation interests. He's been through the wars time after time after time. He's got his lawyers on speed dial. Um, and he is, I, I think it would be fair to characterize him as not a particular friend of, of uh, the Yakima Nation. And no environmentalist I knew had him on speed dial. <laughs> Just, this was not going to work. But Ron realized that Rosa which has some of the most economically productive irrigation land and um, some of the weakest water rights, had a problem. They really need a more reliable water supply. And Black Rock didn't look like it was going to make it. And he couldn't really afford Black Rock even if it did. So he had to take a leap. And what he did was 
he reached out to Phil Rigdon, his counterpart at the Yakima Nation, and said, and said, can Rosa and the Yakima Nation sign a joint letter in opposition to, to BlackRock? Phil is a tribal member. He's the staff director of natural resources for the Yakima Nation. And Phil is a very smart guy. He's got a degree in forestry from uh, University of Washington. He went to the Yale School of Forestry for a master's degree. He knows how to do politics. He knows how to do tribal politics. He works at the state level. He works at the federal level. And he knew that the Yakima Nation was opposed to BlackRock, but he also knew that doing anything with Rosa was a dangerous thing. But Phil managed to get his tribal chairman to sign that letter, and the letter landed with a thud on Derek Sanderson's desk. Derek ran the office of Columbia River for um, the State Department of Ecology. He was charged with developing new water supplies for fish and farmers. BlackRock was the biggest game of town, and Black Rock looked like it was going down. So he got this letter, he read it, and he realized that it said not just no to Black Rock, but it also said yes to fishery restoration, and it said yes to making better use of the water and the infrastructure within the basin. So what, what Derek did was created a plan that would concentrate on really those things. Um, fishery restoration, improved water supply, and making best use of the existing infrastructure. And it created a process to try to get that plan embraced. Michael Garrity and I, Michael Garrity of American Rivers, and I, then working for National Wildlife Federation, contemplated our own cliff dive. We worked for environmental organizations. National Wildlife Federation has a long history of opposition to federal water projects. American Rivers is the leading advocate for taking dams down. Neither organization has ever, ever supported building a dam. Neither organization has ever even thought about supporting building a dam. Michael and I looked at each other, and we, you know, we basically wondered if our bosses were going to fire us for even bringing it up. But climate change changed the, changed the game because we realized that if you wanted salmon back in this basin, you couldn't just be against dams. You had to be for something. You had to be for a comprehensive, integrated plan. You had to, you had to do something more and bigger. And we convinced our bosses that it was worth us taking a leap. So there we are. I I'm not going to bore you with several years of tedious process, um, many, many public meetings. Suffice it to say that I learned far more about irrigation technology, about drought frequency and severity, about climate modeling than I ever expected to. I kicked dirt on farms with state-of-the-art computer-controlled um, irrigation technology, and I kicked dirt on farms that had state-of-the-art technology a century ago and haven't updated a thing. Mm -hmm. My compatriots uh, in the irrigation community learned far more about fishery restoration than they ever wanted to, and believe me, they learned far more about national environmental politics and Seattle environmental politics than they ever wanted to. What we came up with was a 30-year plan to do what Derek had set out in sketch form. Restore hundreds of thousands of salmon back into this, into this basin. Make best use of the water through conservation and efficiency. Embrace water marketing so that water can move around from, from lower value uses to higher value uses. And yes, increase storage. First, by making best use of existing dams and then expanding um, or building, building new dams. It's been a remarkable process to, to get there. It took many, many, many dozens of people taking leaps, putting their reputations and their jobs on the line. But it worked because we came to understand each other's interests. What we ended up with, oh, sorry, one, one last. What we ended up with um, was an unusual set of politics that first allowed us to go to the state legislature and 
get $100 million in a really tough budget year to buy 50,000 acres in the Tianaway, which is critical habitat for steelhead and, and salmon. The Yakima Nation had started introducing sockeye back into Lake Clay Ellum in anticipation of what we did last year, which is break ground on fish passage. You can now, now, <laughs> sorry, my clicker's not working. Um, you can now go into uh, Upper Clay Ellum Reservoir and, and River um, in, the, in the late fall, uh, September, and see spawning sockeye that haven't been there for a hundred years. It's really cool. <laughs> it's really cool. I'm so proud of that. Um, <clears throat> in 2015, the agricultural community survived a really devastating drought in part because of the conservation and efficiency work that, that has been part of this pro process uh, going back several decades. And of course, okay, now we can stop, thank you. Um, and of course, um, Senator Cantwell has, has been involved as well. Senator Cantwell has introduced a bill authorizing the federal parts of this project, including the first major storage element, uh, taking advantage of water that's already in Lake Cachis and uh, accessing it through a drought relief pumping plant. But one of Ed and Representatives Newhouse and uh, Riker are anticipated to introduce a House Companion Bill um, early this year. But one of the really cool things is that the Kibitas Irrigation District, the Kibitas Reclamation District, ran out of water in August last year. Its um, manager, Urban Everhart, realized that he could borrow water from the, district, from the irrigation districts downstream, run it through the Kibitas canals, and siphon it off into the tributaries that were being dewatered because of drought. There were thousands of salmon in those tributaries that would have otherwise died. An urban and Kittitas Reclamation District saved them. There's no reason in the world that KRD couldn't have done that any time in the last 20 or 30 years, but they didn't. They did this year because of the relationships, because they understood what they needed to do to make this basin as a whole work. So I am so proud of, of what we've accomplished. Um, it's, it's really remarkable. Of course, there are people who don't like what we've done. People who are Black Rock supporters still want to go out and get water from the, from the Columbia River. Died in the wool, died hard environmentalists um, can't even believe that we, uh, uh, Michael Garrity and I and our compatriots, have agreed to building new water projects. There are free market advocates and economists who believe that what we really should do first is water marketing. And I actually have some agreement with that. We're doing it, but it's part of this integrated, integrated whole. And there are people who live next to the dams that would be uh, expanded um, or the reservoirs that would be drawn down further who are quite unhappy with the impacts to their interests. And I understand that as well. But I guess the question is, what's the lesson that we've learned? The lesson, I think, from Yakima is, is um, are pretty easy. The doing is harder. <laughs> but what you need to do is pretty easy. First, you have to understand the interests of the people who are your opponents. And we came to do that. I stopped seeing the irrigators as greedy destroyers of fish and rivers. They stopped seeing me as a deluded Seattleite environmentalist, probably <laughs> socialist. Well, maybe they didn't stop seeing me that way. <laughs> at least they figured out they could work with me. Um, and we all realized that we had common enemy. First BlackRock, but then climate change. And in finding and defining that common enemy, we found common ground. We found things that we could all be for. That was enough to get us to a recognition that the old ways of doing business weren't going to work. I mean, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I've litigated. I know I can throw lawsuit bombs. But they don't really solve problems. They can go to the legislature, you know, stop fish passage, whatever. That's fine. Um, but it doesn't actually solve problems. 
In order to solve problems, we needed cliff divers. We needed people who would put their jobs and reputations on the line and make a difference. That's the, that's the Akamas story. And that's, that's really where I should stop this talk, but I'm not going to. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I was, you know, wasting time. And um, I, I went on Google Trends and looked for a list of what issues are Americans most looking at on the internet. And there's some pretty tough issues. When you think about those, they are all polarized issues. If you tell me what your political party is, I can pretty well tell you what position you're going to take. If you tell me where you live, I can probably tell you what position you're going to take. If you tell me what media you, you listen to or watch, I probably can tell you what, what position you're going to take. Our political parties, our media, where we live, um, have all polarized us. And that means we're not going to solve any of these problems. We're going to beat each other over the head with ideology. We're going to make political hay. We're not going to do what we did in Yakima, which is get away from those polarizing positions, actually engage with our opponents, understand their positions, and work towards solution. The lesson from Yakima is that's the only way we're really going to make progress. I'm not going to win otherwise. You're not going to win otherwise. You know, they're not going to win otherwise. We're all going to lose. So what I'd like to do is invite you all to take a dive with me. Let's work together. It matters. Thank you.